Welcome to the weekly meeting of the IP Communications and VoIP community. We're at VUC.me on the web. Some of our community members that give us support are Simwood.com, who can turn you as a developer into a telco. Simwood.com. Our host at PBX is from Onsip.com. And if you go to GetOnsip.com, you can also get a free clickable link. People can call you browser to browser. It's WebRTC. It's 2014, and our website is hosted at Bluehost.com. Thanks to Jared and the guys over there. Or would we be without the best conferencing bridge around, ZipDX.com. We thank David Frankel and ZipDX for their support. As always, full-featured, full-color, full-HD conference bridge. And our local rate dial-ins are from VoxBone.com. Excellent intro. Thank you, Michael. We have a, a terrific guest today. Of course, we have a terrific guest every week. Otherwise, it would be embarrassing not to say that. But Simon, Mike, welcome to the VUC. Thank you. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. It's great to have you. And we're going we're gonna to talk about your book, obviously, because we have a couple of copies to uh, give away. And that would be the Raspberry Pi cookbook. But we're going to talk about some of your other books as well and, and just... Uh, get to know you a little bit in general. Sure. Um, wanted to mention one quick piece of news because I promised to do it. Uh, Kamaiyo World, April 2nd through 4th in Berlin. A lot of us are going to be on, and speaking of a lot of us, I am going to put the film strip back because we have a great group today as well. So the film strip goes back, which means that you can see everybody. And we've got Andy, we have Dan Lane, we've got James Bodie, we've got Life... We have Michael ZipDX, of course, is our audio, Peter Dunkley, and Simon, and that's the order I see people in. Simon, what brought you to technology? You know, I totally um, empathized with uh, some of the text I read about you because, because I, um, as a teenager, was building TV cameras with tubes. How do you that's call so those in English? In my basement. Yeah. Okay. Now, I mean, I started, uh, I mean, I, I always loved science. I had a... I was, fortunate enough to have a really inspiring physics teacher and that kind of got me interested in electronics and um, I used to take myself off to the public library and go and get some old copies of Practical Wireless and Wireless World and um, get some strip board and make some of the, the projects out of there out of there as a teenager. And then I think um, I, I went off to university and I did a course that combined electronics and computer science and then of course when I finished all the jobs are in software. So I kind of spent <laughs> a long time uh, as a programmer and then uh, always with the electronics as a bit of a hobby in the background and then gradually sort of migrated back towards that. Really. Well, Simon, what was what was the technology when you were, say, 13, whenever you first started actually? Oh, when I was 13. Sol were you soldering? Oh, so 13. What was yeah. the technology? Was it transistors? It wasn't tubes like me. It was transistors no, it or it was ICs probably, right? Yeah, it, it was It was just about ICs. If, you, if, I, if I splurged all my pocket money, I could just about afford myself a 555 timer or something. Yeah, but 55 was, timer, um, yeah. <laughs> Any five five five? Or, yeah, we all. Seven four one up amp. <laughs> but it, it was um, yeah. There, there were there were chips about, but a lot of things were um, you know made just with discrete components that were actually if if you compared it like for like incredibly expensive compared yes. with today's things. But so were uh, electronic appliances. So it kind of at the time it was worth making things for yourself because you know uh, I made myself a, a metal detector at one point and. It would just about detect a car if it was about half an inch under the ground. <laughs> it, it really wasn't terribly sensitive, but it's the fun of making it. And I couldn't possibly afford to buy a metal detector because these things were hundreds of pounds. So, you know, a few transistors, very simple beat frequency oscillator design, and some headphones, and there you go. Nice little, little uh, thing to make. So, uh, yeah, everything was kind of, um, you know, you'd, you'd go and buy a resistor, and it would cost you 20 pence or something. Or, whereas you buy a resistor now and it's half events. It's, uh, it's amazing how cheap everything has become in terms of components. My, uh, my own inter introduction to computing, which I didn't actually start when the person told me this, but a very old friend of mine told me, uh, the, you know, the, kinda, the guy who I built the TV camera with in the basement, okay. for example, he told me, well, you know what, computers are like, um, it's like 
exactly like building stuff, like when we built the TV camera, but you never have to go to Radio Shack or worry about having a place open or use solder even. Um, and and that, that eventually became true, and that brings us to the, the Raspberry Pi because yeah. it's a terrific platform. Uh, even for, I guess, when we were 13, um, we could have gotten into that, right? I mean, do you know about yeah. kids kids making stuff with um, with the Pi? Or equivalent? Yeah. I mean, it's um, the, the Raspberry Pi. It's sort of kind of there's really sort of two ways it, it tends to get used. I think it, it's sort of a lot of um, schools have Raspberry Pis in the, especially in the UK, and um, you know, primarily it's a tool for learning Python. Uh, you know, which was the inspiration for the Pi bit of Raspberry Pi. Um, but also, you get um, after school clubs and things like that. So there's, there's a guy up here in the northwest of England. Uh, called Simon Waters, he may even be joining us, I think, so, at some point. Um, and he kind of running after school clubs where he gets kids um, building simple robots using the Raspberry Pi as a controller and um, generally just, you know, fun little projects with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, kind of two ways you can use it. You can just use it as a cheap Linux box, but that's kind of missing the point a little bit because you've got this GPIO connector so you can whack some interesting electronics on it, have it control some hardware, attach an RFID tag reader, you know, all sorts of um, different things you can do with it. I want to do a little bit of a different thing this week from usual, and we're going to get James Bodie in here right away because he's got a great question that I totally empathize with. Uh, go ahead, James. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just wondered, Simon, whether you, too, like, like a number of people here on the shelf, yeah. started off with... Uh, with an Army HF radio at the end of uh, the, at, at the age of 13 years old, because both Andy and I used to talk to each other oh, okay. once upon a time. Yeah, no, I never really got into that. I, got, I sort of um, I was tempted by the idea of CB when CB sort of landed in the UK, um, but um, never never actually kind of got around to that. I was more interested in it. I, I was a, I was a fairly antisocial te teenager. I wasn't really interested in talking to other people. I just wanted to make. Things. <laughs> more interested in a bit of soldering and uh, making something to show off. So you do speak solder? Oh yes, I speak solder, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've just been, you were mentioning uh, tube amps. I don't know if you can you can see this if I hold it up. Building things with tubes. I just, last couple of days I just had a Just a bit higher. A bit higher. Yeah, well, bit higher. Put, it up, put it up a little bit higher. If you can. A bit you higher. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's um, a little tube preamp. Sure. Um, it's the first time I've ever messed with tubes, and I, I decided that it was about time I learned about this technology because you can buy the buy the tubes now. You know they're still making them in China, and you can get all these um, ones from Russia and places. So I thought um, I'd have a go, and actually it's worked out really well. So this this is going to become a part of my hi-fi um, as soon as I put the power supply in the box, because at the moment it's kind of sat here on my work desk just behind there, with lots of bare wires. So. It needs to be put back, put somewhere a bit more um, safe, really. I think a, 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 a good fire vamp has got to have some exposed wires or something. <laughs> <in those parts. laughs> the trouble, well, the the trouble with though, I have to interject <laughs> that, that that really ought to be um, a valve, not a tube. Yeah, I oh, yes. We're going to be British about it. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of that. <laughs> I, I tried to think of what you guys call it. Um, a, a quick um, a DV, uh, a detour here. Simon, yeah. you have a site called monkmakes.com. Here's what yes. the first part looks like. Tell us a little bit about that while we're, while we're uh, watching this. And I want to start, we have this giveaway and I need to type something into IRC. So sure. what's, what's the basis of the site here? Okay, well, it's, it's really um, in response to... The question I get most often about my books, um, because all of my books tend to have a hardware component, you know, there's, there's projects in there or there's examples that you build that illustrate some kind of software point, but you need to connect some hardware to it. And people always want to know where can I get the parts for this or where can I buy the modules. And I don't, I don't, if, you, if you're used to try, if you're trying, I find it hard finding the parts I need from different websites. And um, so somebody who's not trying to do this a lot will you know find it very confusing and very difficult you know I can find it I found a resistor says it's a quarter watt uh, will that work um, it says in your book it should be half a watt and unless you actually kind of know quite a bit about the subject it can be quite difficult to buy the things so the idea is to sell kits of parts to accompany the books really so we started off with a kit for the Raspberry Pi cookbook 
and it's um, simple breadboard cook so, uh, book, uh, kit. So I'm trying to sort of stay away from soldering as much as possible. So it's breadboard and jumper wires and some simple components, and then also some kind of little recipe cards that are sort of based on some of the simpler recipes in the Raspberry Pi cookbook, so that kids can just kind of um, look at the color-coded diagram of the breadboard, use jumper wires, connect everything up, run a little Python script, and have the hardware do something. So there's, there's simple projects like a, a thermometer, um, a sort of light meter, uh, things that are sort of uh, like a sort of lie detector, a proximity detector. Basically, a few simple projects you can do with a fairly minimal set of uh, components. And um, we're actually getting quite a lot of interest from schools and places who want to have kits like this so that they can get their get the kids, particularly in after-school clubs, going on working, you know, building something hardware that's uh, attached to the Raspberry Pi rather than just using it purely for software. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that was monkmakes.com, by the way. Uh, incidentally, I was uh, negligent in not mentioning that people can actually see your main site is simonmonk.com, which is logical. Uh, it's actually simonmonk.org. I'm oh, sorry, simonmonk.org. I would I would much rather have .com, but unfortunately, there's an Australian artist who has simonmonk.com. Cor <laughs> correct. I'm sorry about that. And also uh, on Twitter, I think you're simonmonk2. Correct? Yeah, it's that same pesky Australian artist got the Simon Monk on its oh. own. Oh. <laughs> well, that, that uh, almost brings us to the, uh, the, the giveaway, but the giveaway needs to be on IRC, and I need to type the question in an IRC, which means we need other people to engage here. And who better than James, Andy, or Life, or Dan? I, Dan, uh, do you do uh, Raspberry? I think you do. Yeah, Dan who, does. Who, who, would like to, who would like to discuss a little bit with Simon while I type in this question in IRC to win the well, books? No, I'll have a go. Simon, you don't just do Raspberry Pis, do you? You do Arduinos and other bits too. Yeah, that's right, James. Um, pretty much uh, most of the boards that come out, I try and I have a go at, have a bit of a play with, um, and then it's it's often quite difficult to judge whether they're going to be successful, whether people are going to take up the technology. <coughs> so um, yeah, I've got probably three or four books on Arduino, um, including um, one that's sort of Arduino and Android. So it's, it's got, you know the combination of the two technologies, which is actually quite a good uh, combination because you can get the an Android app. Uh, talking to the Arduino and then the Arduino controlling things. So I've got some, a few sort of home automation projects and things like that. So yes, um, Arduino, uh, Raspberry Pi, of course, and the BeagleBone Black, which I think is a really... Oh, yes. Because I, I think these, I mean, to me it's kind of the American Pi. It's sort of... Um, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> It's, yeah, we, we, we have a couple of members who who, who are really enthusiastic about well, the well, Beagle Bone Black. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really yeah. awful uh, impression of Ken Rice, who sadly can't be with us tonight. But, okay. Uh, yeah, it's he, a good board. I mean, it, it has some advantages over the Raspberry Pi. I mean, it's a little bit more expensive, but then it's also got... It's got memory, yeah, and it's got its memory on board. And it's, yeah. Easier to get going, and of course, all important, it fits precisely in an Altoids tin. It does, yeah. Although you kind of had to remember to insulate the inside before you plonk it in it, really, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go on, Dan. You have a so, go. I was, I was gonna. I was. Go on. Go on, go on, Dan. Dan. I'll, I'll go what, what? What kind of tin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I was going. I was going to. Um, I was actually going to. Going to. Show you something that I got in the post the other day, actually, which was uh, oh, okay. one of one of these, yeah. which is uh, an Arduino oh, with, okay. with Wi-Fi. Okay. And it just uh, sits on a little breadboard header. Um, yeah. And I was gonna, uh, I was just gonna show that off, basically. No, uh, the Arduino has almost become kind of a, a the technology used to program the thing, hasn't it? Because it's just yeah. it's no longer just the Arduino Uno, and the, uh, it's, it's pretty much the only one that people use. You just I, think got, I think we've got Darth Vader on Zip DX. We probably Hold need on, that's one John. Second. John, uh, I'm going to have to mute you because you're. As soon as I can. Oh, he's, done, done, done. Yeah, John. Oh, okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Very Sorry very about, that. about that. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay. Yeah. Have you um, have you looked at the Makey Makey as well? That's quite a good one for um, for younger kids to learn. Yeah, it's a nice idea because I mean the 
the whole sort of touch sensing technology is really mm. a lot of fun, isn't it? I mean, this thing you can just sort of, you know, plug potatoes into your Arduino or you know, Arduino compatible board and start mm. doing things with it. I, I think all great educational tools, and uh, I think that's the thing. You can kids can get this stuff and they can just start playing with it now. They can there's there's various different levels of entry. So if they're feeling quite ambitious and they're a bit older, they can just go straight into buying a, an Arduino starter kit and yeah. um, get some code because. It, I shouldn't be saying this, but kind of you don't really need books anymore, do you? And the first, <laughs> my, you know, my kids don't really use books. <laughs> but I try and get them to, put, you know, I got my, my youngest son Matthew's quite interested in technology, and I give him a, you know, try and get him to follow some of the examples in the book. And he said, "No, nah, it's just too slow. I'll just go on YouTube. Somebody will show me how to do it." And it's a different way of learning, but I don't think it's necessarily a worse way of learning because. It gets you started, and once you have got started, and once you are doing it, then you can always come back and fill in the gaps and pick so, up the theory. So, will your next book have some uh, YouTube accompaniments? <laughs> well, actually, the O'Reilly book, the Raspberry Pi cookbook. Um, I just I spent a, a week with O'Reilly making videos to to accompany it. Okay. Um, but um, they, they've done that in a kind in a in a closed source way, it's going, they're going to be um, uh, you know, selling the video, well, they, they are yeah. selling the videos as a set as well. But um, I do have, uh, I do put quite a lot of videos up, just the showing projects from the books and um, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Excellent. So I, I was going to ask um, about, since you're, you're interested in valve amplifiers, I'm going to assume that you're interested in audio as well. Um, I was wondering if you do some, if you could compare the the BeagleBone Black with the Raspberry Pi for audio purposes. I mean, which one should I be be using? Right, I I, I don't know enough about the uh, that that side of things with those two boards. I'm afraid. I know the um, well the Raspberry Pi. I know has two uh, has like a dedicated two dedicated channels, doesn't it? That you can also hijack for using um, for PWM. Kind of shares them uh, with, with as PWM channels. I, I don't really have any figures about resolution and quality and that sort of thing. I mean, just sort of um, subjectively, sort of watching videos and playing the sound files. It sounds okay to me. I'm not really. I'm kind of getting into being an audiophile I've, because since um, electronics has sort of become stop being my hobby and started being the way I make a living, I've been having to look for a new hobby. So I've just bought myself a new turntable and I've just. Started. I, I built this preamp, the valve preamp, and then the ne my next step is to kind of get a, a, a tone control system, and then the next step after that, I'm going to build myself a, a big power amp. And uh, so I'm sort of gradually getting back into that, that kind of thing. Tim, it's um, Tim. It's 2014. Um, you should really be outputting a straight bitstream into a dedicated amplifier, not relying on the device itself. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go back to, to using the, the, the Raspberry Pi as a, an educational tool and with your kits, yeah. do, do you see much uh, of a problem where people get a bit ham-fisted and they, they connect the wrong things to the wrong things and they inject voltages up the wrong pins? Uh, I mean, is, is it all opto-isolated? Is, is, is there any uh, protection there? Or, and do, do no. people actually manage to blow these things up very much? I managed to kill two of them. But then I'm not always the most careful, <laughs> and I tend to be in a bit of a hurry. And whereas I maybe should power it down and then connect the leads up and then uh, power it up again, I don't always do that. So it, yeah, there is no buffering. Um, the GPIO pins are really quite fragile. Um, they can only cope with something like three milliamps. So you can you can you, you can burn out a GPIO pin. Yeah, just by connecting an LED and not putting a series resistor on it or putting too low a value of series resistor. So yes, it's there. It's a bit risky doing that. I think um, fortunately the things are relatively cheap, so I suppose you just have to accept that there's going to be a fair amount of casualties with the with the boards and uh, replace them as necessary. I do have a couple of boards actually where I've just managed to kill the odd GPIO pin, so I can actually. Um, just avoid that pin, and the thing works fine. Or I dedicate it to some use where I don't need <laughs> GPIO pins. Uh, so, yeah. Here you go, Andy. Here's here's one I broke earlier for you. It's meant to be a whole ring of LEDs, but only one of them works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so e e even people with some experience in this can uh, can quite easily break these things. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the time um, the the Pi Face interface board is is I, I know the guy who, who developed this, um, Andrew, and he one of the things he did is kind of test what happens when you put the put the uh, Raspberry Pi. It's it's an interface board that fits on top of the Raspberry Pi, and it's very much designed for use in education. So it's robust and it's solid, and it has got buffered inputs, and it doesn't mess about with transistors for controlling output. It's got just got there's great relays. So the whole thing is designed to be fairly indestructible, you know, indestructible, and it's probably a good bet for the classroom environment. Really, I think probably with if you're looking at sort of older kids who you know, got a degree of responsibility and you tell them, please don't break this, uh, then I, I guess you got a bit more <laughs> leeway with it. Possibly. On the other hand, you've just told them it's easy to break. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, consider it a challenge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do, does anybody Probably. actually use... Uh, for those, for those people who aren't the way, there are two models of the, the Raspberry mm. Pi, the Model A and the Model B. Um, the Model A not having uh, any of the Wi-Fi, not the Wi-Fi, um, Ethernet connection. Yeah. I think that's the main difference. Does actually anybody actually use the Model A? And, and are any of your projects in, in the book suitable for a Model A, or is it Model B only? Well, yes. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't really get the Model A. I think it was almost there to fulfil a promise that they said they were going to produce one that was going to be at that price point, and so they they, they made one. Because it, it is the Model B board, but it's just got um, the it hasn't got the Ethernet controller chip soldered onto the board, and it hasn't got the Ethernet jack, the LJ45 jack, soldered on there, and it has half the memory. But apart from that, it's basically the same. And um, I, I've got one, and no, I don't really use it. I might find some dedicated purpose for it um, because, of course, it has got the USB, only a single USB socket on it. So you can still put a Wi-Fi adapter on it. So you can still make it connected and have it do something useful. But no, it's not It's not massively useful uh, as a device, really. It'd be okay in some dedicated situations. Yeah, it's, probably, it's a bit like the BBC Micro, isn't it? Because they had a Model A. Model A and Model ne B. Yeah. yeah, never sold any, but they, they, they still <laughs> had it. Um, and everybody had Model Bs. <laughs> I think it can be quite useful if you're building something that requires um, a few different devices. Uh, say you're just doing GPIO stuff and you don't need real-time communications. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to go down to learning about Arduino and you've already learned about the Raspberry Pi. It could be just an affordable way to just deploy a bunch of devices rather than, or play yeah. with a bunch of devices rather than, you know, spend out for the big one. But there's not, it's not exactly like the price difference is hugely... Uh... No, it, it isn't really. It's not, not worth um, the justifying the difference. But, I mean, it, it does mean that the, you know, the, the Model A really, you could use it in place of an Arduino because you... Yeah. Same price, really, or a bit cheaper, I think, even. Um, almost. But, um, yeah, I, I think dedicated applications... And I mean, that's the thing about even, even the Model B Raspberry Pi is that it's cheap enough to just dedicate to one purpose. So yeah. you're not kind of, um, it's, you know, you've got a whole Linux box. Even if you just want to waste it just being a browser that displays a slideshow, it's kind of still a cheap way of doing it. Hmm. Hmm. So, Simon, mm -hmm. where, where, where are you going to go next? You, you've kind of covered the Raspberry Pi yeah. in, in some detail. What devices are next in your pipeline? Okay. Um, well, I've got a book uh, coming out in on BeagleBone Black. Um, it's just going through kind of the proofing stage uh, at Tab. It's going to be programming the BeagleBone Black. So um, I've, I've sort of got a mini series going on really with programming the Arduino, programming the Raspberry Pi, and then this will be programming the BeagleBone Black. So that'll be out, uh, I think, April sort of time, maybe a bit sooner actually, because uh, they're trying to get it out quickly. Um, I've also got um, another Arduino book on the go. This is kind of, it's a sort of mega project book. It's actually going to be called the Tab Book of Arduino Projects. Um, and I'm working on that most of the time at the moment, and it's going to have 40 Arduino projects in it. Um, and I've also just finished uh, a book on uh, EagleCAD, on the PCB design software. Because it's one of those pieces of software that's just a little bit mental. It's sort of you, you do everything in the wrong order. You have to kind of select a tool and then select things to apply it to. And it's just kind of it's a bit of a strange metaphor, but it's a very powerful piece of software. And once you get used to it, it's fine, but it just takes a bit of uh, getting going on. So I kind of think there's a, a good, a bit of a niche there 
for a book that explains how to use it in uh, uh, fairly straightforward terms. Yes, yeah. use the manual for it. It's about 300 pages long and is incredibly thorough in a, in a very, it's, it's actually, the, the product is originally German and I hate to do racial stereotyping, but I will anyway. It's actually very thorough, very organized, very structured, but you can't find a bloody thing in it. And it doesn't lead you through things in a nice tutorial fashion. It's very much, there are things in there that you can find that explain exactly how it works. More of a specification than a, a readable book. Yeah, so, well, yeah, I think we understand totally <laughs> what you mean. Um, okay. Anyway, something I would like to see is, is more stuff being done with um, low-cost Android, because you can, you can buy cheap yeah. seven-inch Android tablets for, I don't know, 50 quid now. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, of course, you can put Android on the BeagleBone Black, and, you know, many people do. But, I mean, also, uh, you're right, if you buy one of these tablets, um, and it, I think that, I mean, the tablets will generally have USB hosts, so you can um, connect them to um, an Arduino uh, fairly easily and, and have the Arduino actually controlling the electronics and doing that side of things and the Android tablet acting as the user interface. Uh, so I mean, I, get, I do have a book. It's a little out of date now, to be honest. It's about three years old on um, using uh, on Arduino and Android projects. It's another one of the Evil Genius series, and yeah, it's um, it's a very cheap screen for an Arduino. Is one way to look at an Android. Yeah, they come fully loaded with lots of stuff, don't they? Camera yeah. and radios and touchscreen. Yeah. So, it can do all the heavyweight processing. You've got you know, probably a gigahertz and a couple of cores at your disposal, and the Arduino can handle the trivial messing around with um, volts bit. That's yeah. right, interfacing to lumps of hardware. Anyway, I think Randy has a question for yeah, you. Yeah, uh, but I'm discouraged for asking that. I'll ask that later maybe uh, to the entire group. This is Simon, a quick question. This is kind of a question that is um, very much present in the minds of most people. Um, which is the presence of the female uh, gender in all of this. Are you seeing yeah. any interest in particular? I mean, t you know where I'm going with this. So yeah. do you see our girls, 13-year-old girls, uh, getting into this kind of thing, the Raspberry Pi or the Arduino or any of this kind of maker kind of thing? What do you, what do you see there? Anything? Yeah, a little. Not as much as I would like to see. I think um, there's, I go along to the local Raspberry Jam event up here, mm -hmm. and um, you do see quite a few. There's a, there's a few girls come along with parents, and uh, you know they've they've uh, done something in Scratch or um, you know learning Python or whatever. The, the, there's one girl who's absolutely brilliant, a mini geek girl who comes along occasionally. I think she lives in Manchester somewhere, and she's done this. She's done um, implemented uh, um, the game of life on a little LED matrix attached to the Raspberry Pi. Very, very impressive. So there are people out there doing this, but, but not enough. And I think it probably kind of has to happen in schools, really, doesn't it? It has to be, you know, when, uh, when, it, when it's taught well in class, people want to um, continue and find out more about it and, and do this kind of stuff. But and the I'm, parents, and the parents too. I mean, yeah. parents are unfortunately uh, largely... Uh, guilty of uh, of um, you know pointing uh, to to be the stereotype, uh, the pointing girls towards dolls and 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 boys yeah. towards the chemistry set. And isn't the, the 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 pie and other things like it are really the chemistry set uh, that I played with when I was like nine years old? I mean now the yeah. same similar idea only with a computer. So hopefully that'll yeah. change though. I'd I'd like to see a change personally, and I think that that's one vector to getting more women into tech. Rather than forcing the issue by you know trying to uh, uh, get go to any extensive efforts to get people of a certain uh, sex or whatever on panels and so on, that's all great. But really, yeah. the interest has to be generated. I think it does. It, it does have to be. And I think I suppose part of the whole um, being a bit geeky has started to become a little bit more cool. So maybe it will become a little bit cool for both genders rather than <laughs> just for, for men. I mean, and you know, men and boys. Um, I mean, my niece has got a Raspberry Pi and uh, you know, her dad has sort of you know, taken her through using this and got a program and she really got into it. And I think it's if you've got you know an inquisitive child and most children are you, you point them at something interesting like a Raspberry Pi and you get them started that they will find the fun things to do with it won't they it's just kind of putting it in front of them to get them going I think that's the trick 
Absolutely. Uh, Boatman said in IRC, and I agree with this, Raspberry Pi and related projects are the new amateur radio. You mentioned CB, yeah. Simon. M many of us here are hams. I was when I was 13 as well. Uh, right. Let's yeah, see. I think most of us were, actually. I think almost everybody here was, except Simon, who wanted to be CB. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Real quick comment here, and then we'll turn it over to somebody else. Uh, I would like to make sure that everybody in the... Uh, on the ZipDX bridge knows that you can unmute by hitting star six and if you're ready to ask a question or ask your question in uh, uh, in IRC, Carl Fife is with us too and if he's on the bridge, Carl you're there, any comments or questions? Oh, um, yeah, I, I joined a little bit late so I'd have to apologize, if it hasn't been already asked, um, I'd be curious to know kind of where the Raspberry, what, you know, I don't know where, where the Raspberry Pi sits with regard to other uh, projects like, you know, uh, you know what its role will be, sort of going forward, and how it will be known in history c compared to other possibilities like, you know, BeagleBone and and uh, and you know, full-on x86 type embedded yeah. systems. And uh, while we're there, like what about the Nuke, the Intel Nuke, which everybody tells me is too expensive? That yes. was my other question. Was are I you interested in that? Thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is, it's very exciting times because there are just so many things coming out there, you know, uh, things popping up on Kickstarter and other crowdsource funding places and, you know, just all the time. And I think they're all, you know, originally you kind of just had a few products in you. You basically had, a, well, for a long time, you pretty much just had an Arduino or you had a, a sort of fairly small single board computer that would just about run... Windows XP or something, and now you've got all these different um, different platforms available that just fit different niches. So you sort of go from the very very low level stuff where you've got uh, um, things like the uh, the Flora, um, not the Flora, um, Adafruit just produced a little tiny um, AT tiny based microcontroller that's only a few dollars and it runs the Arduino IDE and it has a USB interface. Very small, very low powered, but absolutely fine if you just want to control a single RGB LED or do something, you know, fairly straightforward. And then it just gradually works its way up. And so instead of kind of just saying you've got an Arduino Uno and that's pretty much your lot, you've just got all of these, this, you know, whole range that takes you just from basic hardware controlling um, cheapest chips, things that you can just um, use, you know, embed in a system up through to slightly more, you know, to more sophisticated devices where you start to get into sort of ARM territory and higher power devices like the, the Raspberry Pi. And I guess, you know, the sort of tipping over point is as soon as you start to need to do things like use open computer vision or um, do a lot of uh, internet stuff with the with the device then you switch away from the really simple 8-bit processor up to something a bit more beefy and then um, you know so on up like that and you, you've got a whole range of different devices so when you're planning a project you can sort of um, you can pick from a huge range of different types of Arduino or say I want an Arduino talking to a Raspberry Pi or I want one of these sort of hybrid devices which you know a Raspberry Pi with an Arduino well, sorry, now an ARM board with um, Arduino shield sockets so that you can plug hardware directly into it. So it's just a lot of options now, you, plenty of things to choose from. And certainly at the lower end of things, because they're all kind of standardizing on the Arduino IDE as the means of programming it, you got one technology to learn. You haven't got to learn a lot of other things with it. Bit more complicated when you get up to the sort of higher end devices. Then you've got some, the, you get the proliferation of all these different programming environments, and it all gets a bit more difficult. But again, people tend to kind of pick the one they know, or you know, use or standardize on Python. And this is also an integral part, or could be, of the uh, the latest buzzword of the year, which is Internet of Things. Mm. So Raspberry Pis could be, or any of the other devices you mentioned for that matter, can be sitting yeah. on your thermostat or there's, there's a whole bunch of other projects that can be done as long as you've got an Ethernet uh, or some kind of Wi-Fi, whatever, connection, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Is there much of that in the book, by the way? Um, yeah, in the, well, in the Raspberry Pi cookbook, there's um, a little bit of sort of um, controlling things, you know, controlling high power things like motors and what have you, and how to create a, a simple web interface to control them, which is, I mean, mostly when you're getting into things like home automation, that's, that's what you want. You want a web interface because 
then all you need to do to be able to do it from anywhere is just open up the right ports on your on your router, and then suddenly um, you can open your door to burglars from anywhere in the world. Actually, you probably want uh, an Android and an iOS um, app to to talk to the thing. But um, so, quick quick question that I did not see in the book because I didn't read it page by page. Um, mm. The inter you mentioned interface, yeah, that's always been the problem, I.O. So we're yeah. controlling a motor. What are the availability? What's the availability for you need a board, an add-on board, obviously, that can talk to motors or relays? or How's that all done? Yeah. Um, showing my age with relays. I, I don't suppose relays are actually used these days. But they are, actually. Are the equivalent yeah. power trains. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. no. people, people use them all the time. I've got relays running my traffic lights connected oh, okay. to an Arduino. Oh, I thought yes. you had relays in your underpants. Yeah, he does. He does, obviously. <laughs> Simon, uh, what are the options? Steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> the, the <laughs> options for, uh, for I.O. on that level of controlling power things, obviously. How is it? Yeah, how's that? I mean, on the Raspberry Pi, you just have um, digital inputs and outputs. So they're low voltage, low current. Um, you can't control anything sizable. If you want to drive a motor or anything like that, then yes, you have to um, generally either buy um, a board that fits onto the Raspberry Pi. And there's a couple, I mentioned the, the Pi face, that's one board that fits on there. And that gives you actually two relays to use, as well as a few other um, different. Um, buffered inputs and outputs. Um, I also um, sell a board through uh, SparkFun called the Raspberry Robot Board, which has a, an H-Bridge motor control on it. So with that, you can control a couple of um, motors. It's really, an, and it also has a voltage regulator on it, so you can power the whole Pi and everything from batteries. Um, so you can either buy a plug-in board that goes on the Raspberry Pi and then um, that connect things directly onto that, or you can just use jumper wires connected to breadboard and then put your plug your components into the solderless breadboard and connect everything up that way. Now you're talking my language. Okay, that's outputs. What about inputs? In other words, sensors. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, what is there anything really geeky or crazy available in my day? I say yeah. this just to give everybody a thrill. In my day, like the big sensor was the mercury switch. <laughs> if you turn something like this, then yeah. The, you know, but anyway, You're what, showing what to, your your roots now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but what um what interesting stuff? I mean, can you have like, you know, the iPhone, and I'm sure all Android yeah. phones have like gyroscopes and so. What kind yeah. of uh, interesting sensors can you get? To, uh, thermometer, voltage, yeah. whatever. Pretty much any kind of sensor you can attach to the Raspberry Pi. The, well, okay, I'll qualify that. The Raspberry Pi doesn't have analog inputs. So right. you can get around that a little bit because if you have resistive sensors, sensors like photoresistors or um, thermistors, you can um, you can you can use them to charge a capacitor. See how long it takes the capacitor to get over the threshold voltage between a, being a one and a zero on a digital input, and then use that timing information to take a sensor reading. It's not going to be terribly accurate. Because um, capacitors are only accurate to 10%, but you've only generally, but you've got yourself um, a, a simple, crude way of doing analog inputs. But an awful lot of um, kind of modern sensors use the I squared C interface bus. So the Raspberry Pi has has an I squared C uh, interface. So you get um, humidity sensors, um, uh, temperature sensors. Uh, well, yeah, and, and of course, things like um, you mentioned gyroscopes and accelerometers, all using the I2C standard. Um, so these can be connected almost directly to the Raspberry Pi. The only thing you sometimes have to watch is that the, that the logic level is 3 volts and not 5 volts, and you're not going to um, fry anything. Uh, but yeah, plenty of, plenty of options out there. So it's a, re it's a real chemistry set. I want to find out if anybody else... Uh, has questions in IRC or in we're having a big laugh in IRC by the way um, let's see if I can read any of these jokes there's too many and they're too too long to read but there's a lot of funny comments in there uh, including a contest about you know who had to walk the longest to school the equivalent the geek equivalent of that which is uh, in a boatman said, "In my day, we had to tilt the mercury switch uphill both ways." For example, a, a, a twist on the joke about taking the school bus and walking to school. I'm not seeing any questions there. Anybody in um, ZipDX? We've got a bunch so of people I, called in. So Go ahead, yeah. Tim. So, so I'm I'm just gonna, in case anybody doesn't know this, my my Raspberry Pi has pretty much exclusively been doing duty as a 
as a disposable asterisk box, which brings us back to the kind of exploit users conference um, aspect of things. So it's been running as a very small PBX in some strange places. Um, James will will uh, remember that I used it for an Astrocon demo a couple of years ago, and it's been out to Burning Man a couple of times. And it, I think actually it routed a few thousand calls while we were out there the year before last. It didn't didn't see service this year. It came with me, but it didn't didn't actually get plugged in this year. Um, so it's been out in a hot and dry environment, but. The thing I love about it is that it's kind of disposable. You know, if I if I fry it, well, you know, I can always buy another one. Um, yeah, and it, and it doesn't consume a lot of power either. So right. there is a there well, is a good good question in um, in IRC about where to buy these things. Anybody have any recommendations? And Simon, you first, as far as um, where where's the best place to obtain to acquire the pie? The Raspberry Pi? Um, well, I, I live um, very close to a company called CPC, which are part of the Farnell Group, and they, and they stock them and have a trade. In it, so I just, I can, I can, I can. In the UK, actually, you can buy Raspberry Pis almost anywhere. There's a chain of um, electronic retail stores uh, called Maplins, which is, I suppose, a bit like Radio Shack, and they stock these things. And I know in the Radio Shack in the states, do they sell Raspberry Pi or just Arduino? I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, but I mean, there's. Um, I have to plug uh, my my friends who run a um, a shop called Inventory in in Manchester that has Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and cameras and stuff, and oh. uh, and they also run kind of evening nights for uh, for startups and and geeks to get their heads around it. And indeed, they have a girl geek um, uh, thing at the weekends as well. So they're kind of big on trying to. Um, Trying to encourage the community, so I drop them a mention. Okay, and uh, rule rule mentioned in IRC also USMCM. Is that you, rule? Who is about to speak? No. Yeah, I think maybe? MCM are actually uh, kind of the um, the they're part of the same group. They're part of Farnell as well. I think they're basically the the American CPC. So they have. Uh, I know they stock all of these, the Raspberry Pi stuff, including the camera and various add-on mod modules that you can get for it. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, question, questions for Simon? Yeah, go ahead. Randy, this is Jay Carpenter in Phoenix. Um, hey, John. Maybe Jay. you've already covered, covered this. Um, is there a, a new version of the Raspberry Pi that's uh, on the horizon to uh, replace the B? That is a good question. Simon, do you know? No, I, I, I don't know. I have heard rumors, but I mean, there are only rumors that there'd be a, a essentially a kind of the C, as it were, would be, a, would be a bigger version of the B, maybe with four USB ports. But that is only a rumor. I don't know for sure. Because the B has been out for, what, about a year and a half now? Yeah, and I guess it's probably, I don't know. I mean... Does it need an upgrade? It's kind of good enough for most purposes, isn't it? If you upgrade it, you just start using more power well, and you just end up with a bigger and bigger device. Well, as compared to the BeagleBone, which I believe has no JS installed on it, yeah. um, you know, I, I've worked with some folks that have tried to put no JS on the Raspberry Pi, which I guess is doable, but it's... Um, a challenge. So, um, yeah. anyway, we, we we ran into some limitations, and uh, uh, it was just kind of looking forward to the next generation of the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I mean, the Raspberry Pi is fairly amenable to being overclocked, isn't it? Because you you can put it up to run at a gigahertz, which is I know it's not always comparable, but it's normally the same. Then there's a, a BeagleBone Black. Uh, in terms of memory and kind of raw processor speed, um, and the and the overclocking is kind of sensitive. So if it gets too hot, it does just lower its clock rate, and you can get these little stick-on heat sinks and things. Or and people have even water cooled their Raspberry Pis, I think, which is just frankly ludicrous. But you know, there are ways I think of probably get squeezing a bit more uh, power out of them. Hey, Randy. Yeah. Maybe better. Yeah. This is Rich Neese. Long time no speak. Ah, um, so, yeah, and I now we can question. hear you, too. 
Okay. Go ahead. You have a question uh, for Simon on the Raspberry Pi? Well, it was to match the Raspberry Pi. People were talking about different boards. There's a couple different boards out there, and it depends on if you're doing, um, if you want to do hardcore PBX versus light core PBX. A um, couple I suggest that people go look, and I did it on IRC, is go look at the Odroid U3, which is a brand new board. It's basically the equivalent price of the Beagle Bone Black. It's also the equivalent of the price of the other board that we, we've been testing with, which is the Kubi Board 2, um, along with the Arduinos. They're all about the same price nowadays. They're, they're all about uh, $50, $60, bucks, um, and cases are out there for all of them. We've currently tested the U3, which is a quad-core, and we've tested the Odroid, which is dual core, and they both do really well for uh, PBX systems and for other designs. We're using one right now. We're designing a home automation system, and uh, the Kubi works well. The Odroid works well. We had problems with the Beagle Bone Black just not having the power we needed. So, uh, but all the boards seem pretty good. Mm. Okay. So. Anything else on? Um Simon's uh, great work on the books, or James, please. Yeah, can I just uh, uh, plug um, Ward Mundy's work with uh, Asterisk sure. on the Raspberry Pi and the Beagle Bone Black as well. If you haven't seen it, it's worth, I've dropped a link in, uh, in the text chat, haven't put it in, in IRC yet. Um, what he's managed to do, or he, he and the, the team have managed to do, is put a fully functional uh, PBX with all the bells and whistles, including fax, voicemail, you name it, weather station, the whole lot, all running on a Raspberry Pi. Quite incredible. So if you haven't seen it, Simon. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I'll have to go and have a look. Yeah, Ward Monday. Yeah. Um, it's uh, nerdvittles, what is dot com? Dot com is yeah, ner it? nerdvittles is what the Nerd site Vittles. And uh, he communicated just, back. Just you guys know. Sorry, he he, he he communicated back and said sorry that he couldn't make it. He's moving house today. So we that sounds okay. like a good excuse. I think he it's, needs more room to get all those Raspberry Pis in. Actually, <laughs> just so you guys know, for those of you using Masterix who want to also learn, we've done the same thing with Free Switch and the Fusion PBX. We have managed to make a complete working system. On the Beagle Bone Black, on on uh, the Odroid, the U3, the U2, the X2, we have full builds and working on them also for free switch uh, that will give you a fully functional PBX. So, okay, thank you for that, Rich. We have one final question. At least I think it's a final question. And now here's one final question from Carl Fife. Although the words one and final are not contractual. So, <laughs> more accurately, here's Carl Fife with a series of questions and sub-questions that may or may not be possible to answer. Carl? Uh, thank you, Allison, and uh, thanks, Randy. <laughs> so, um, my question is, um, is a little abstract, but um, that's apropos of Allison's introduction. So, you know, I, one of the things I've observed is that the sort of the next generation or the up-and-coming generations of programmers are sort of so insulated by higher and higher level languages uh, that mm -hmm. they sort of get kind of far away from the metal and, you know, uh, concepts of things like, you know, a simple, you know, transistor is fairly straightforward, but when you start getting into, you know, and, nan, nor, or, gates, not to mention the assembly of set gates into things like binary adders and half adders and so on, you know, the, the, this, you know, they're basically getting far away from the metal, as it were, yeah. and, and I wonder if you could speak to kind of, um, you know, as I've been watching this maker movement, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, a lot of Western economies that are essentially, you know, forgetting how to make stuff because, you know, a lot of manufacturing is going to, to uh, you know, emerging markets and things like that. And so, but I see this maker movement as being a force in the opposite direction, a very important force in the opposite direction. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the yeah, you have an sure. opinion about, you know, this part of the maker movement as it relates to that. More importantly, 
um, the, this part of the maker movement as it relates to these specifically lower power boards. You know, for example, if yeah. you're writing a routine on on an Arduino and, or or on something that's a you know a, a you know a locking CPU interrupts that would otherwise you know you have to sort of be aware of kind of the some of the um, some of the mechanics of uh, microprocessing and yeah. uh, and you know I, th I, th anyway, I think that, that that knowledge and Go ahead. yeah that's a really interesting question and I think this it isn't you don't just have to look at things like Arduino for solving that problem I mean yes Arduino is brilliant because um, ultimately you've got um, 2k of RAM to play with all right your program can be a bit bigger but you don't have a lot of room you've really got to be think about your code and um, it you know actually write concise code for it and you're writing in C so you're writing at a fairly low level you, you're kind of just above assembler really so I think that's good but also very interestingly I think in terms of learning the fundamentals of how these things work it, it's a little bit abstract but actually um, Minecraft if you start building have we got any Minecraft people out there but I've, I've been playing with that with my son and um, you start making these redstone contraptions and my son was coming along to me and saying you know okay um, how do I combine these AND gates to do something and I want to make myself a flip-flop so all the kind of the fundamentals of logic um, kind of in this game they're a little bit abstract and they're very slightly wrong in some cases particularly in kind of mm -hmm. the way electricity seems to kind of flow endlessly in one direction in Minecraft but kids are learning to use this um, you know they're learning principles and they're learning how to learn about that kind of technology and how mm -hmm. things work and with so many things if you start off with the easy route to it you know the easy access to get started with it you eventually that spurs the interest that then leads you on to learn it more formally when you get older to right. pick that kind right. of degree when you go to university and actually start you know making things for real but you can learn the basics in sort of abstract ways I mean I, this, the same is true of the uh, Kerbal Space Program absolutely fantastic game where you build yourself these rockets and you learn all sorts about Newtonian physics and uh, retrograde firing of engines and all sorts of stuff that I really don't know, understand but you know it's all things that you're learning from these these very inventive games that um, really you know, deserve some positive mentions rather than it being kind of you know a, a vehicle for teenagers to sit in their rooms and be antisocial all right they might be sitting right. in their rooms and being antisocial but at least they're learning something useful while they're doing it so it's good good stuff out there and perhaps doing it at a at a time in their you know cognitive development, which is uh, you know, which uh, you know formally would be referred to as a critical yeah. period. You know, yeah, so, absolutely. You, know, you can learn yeah. to speak a second language when you're when you're 16. You can learn to speak it uh, as it's as though it's your first tongue, and uh, not so when you're 30. And I'm guessing that similarly, if you can if you can um, build the conceptual scaffolding and the conceptual frameworks, like you said, with just yeah. some of these basic concepts, then when you do get into your, you know, into your professional career, into your formal education, um, those yeah. things will be uh, much more duck soup-like. Yes, very <laughs> much. So, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Touching slightly on the um, concept of. Um, for want of a better phrase, sort of gamification of coding, yeah. there is, um, I think I mentioned this on, my, on, on the um, Kama Elio World uh, panel last year, there's a London-based video game studio called uh, Quato Studios who mm. have an iPad game called Hackitsu. And uh, it's a robot fighting game where you create these big robots and then you fight them with other people. Okay. But in order to make your robots do things, you have to write JavaScript. Okay. So yeah. it gives you a really fun re or gives kids, not not us. We're far too grown up for this sort of thing. Obviously, <laughs> um, it gives it gives kids really yeah. good reasons to learn to learn to code. Yes, I think that's another motivation for using the Raspberry Pi for more than just software. Sorry, more than just on-screen software. If, if your only interaction with the real world is the is the monitor and the keyboard and the mouse, that's kind of what you do all the time on a computer. It's not that interesting, is it? Um, the moment you start doing something as stupid as just blinking an LED, suddenly you've got a completely different 
interface device that you never didn't know you could actually influence in the things in the real world with software, and that, and again that is something that pulls people into programming because they want to make it do something. They want to. Um, there's some great um, sort of hacks gone on with the Raspberry Pi um, edition of Minecraft where you know people have kind of done these sort of crossover. Um, Real world, virtual world implementations. Where I, I've seen um, there's a the Raspberry Pi hackathon last year. There's um, some guys who'd made a a door lock, a physical door lock that you unlocked from within Minecraft, and it unlocked your physical door. And you can you can do that in the opposite direction as well. Um, you know, do do things like that. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. Okay, in the meantime, we're having a reunion with a bunch of old-timers on IRC, people I haven't seen in years on the channel. Simon, um, I think we've covered what we need to cover. I would love to uh, have you come back sometime uh, on uh, yeah, maybe sure. Facebook or whatever. We don't actually normally cover kind of things like this, but on the other hand, everyone here is into this kind of thing, so there's no reason why we shouldn't. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, the You're welcome. Better. It's been a pleasure. You mentioned before you go... Uh, yes, James, you're a little bit soft, but go ahead. Am I? Um, in, uh, in Berlin, at Camarillo World, we're running a segment called Dangerous Demos, which is just made for Raspberry Pis. Yep. So, um, if if you could make your way to but uh, to Berlin, I'm sure you would be a you'd have a whole range of things you could demonstrate, Simon. Right. Yes. Well. Yeah. I have to think about that. I've actually I've got a, a, a dangerous Arduino projects book. So well, they don't actually have to be uh, dangerous. They, <laughs> it could be just useful. But no, uh, I like the idea of dangerous. I think that's much more fun. Definitely entertaining. <laughs> yes. Okay. Excellent. We're going to cut off the public part. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Simon, again. You're welcome. Goodbye, thank, you. thank you. Thank you all of you who are who participated. Uh, Andy, Dan, James, Michael. Thanks for all you've done. Uh, Peter. Uh, who am I missing here? Somebody I can't see. We will be saying goodbye, but the Mature Audiences version is coming up in just a moment. Thanks also to our sponsors. That would be Simwood.com, OnSip.com, and of course the uh, good auspices of ZipDX.com and Voxbone.com and Bluehost for the site. Good night, everybody. Good day, good morning, whatever time it is there. Talk to you soon.